time at the end. I um, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today and uh, attending our um, workshop from Watt ECS on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy or EIS. Um, it will be hosted by uh, Aslan Kozakian. I hope I said that right. Um, yep. At the University of Waterloo or University of Alberta. He's a postdoc working in Mark Seconell's lab. Um, works on fuel cell type tech um, type technologies, and um, yeah, we're really excited to uh, hear from Aslan. And just a, a small note for any chemical engineers at the University of Waterloo, we will be posting. A seminar attendance code uh, with when there's about 15 minutes left. So this is an hour and a half workshop. So in about hour 15 minutes, we'll be posting the seminar code. And yeah, so I think that's all the housekeeping. So yeah, with that, I'd like to welcome, give a warm welcome to Aslan Kozakian. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Keith, for the introduction. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, let's dive just right into it. So as this presentation it will be an introduction to electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Um, my, let me fix my slides one second. Uh, there you go, now it works. Um, so uh, dynamic behavior of electrochemical systems is affected by several transient phenomena, including charge transport, electrochemical reactions, and mass transport. Because these processes occur at different timescales, we can analyze them separately by looking at the frequency composition or the dynamic response of the cell. This is the main idea of the experimental technique called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, or EIS, where we analyze the dynamic behavior of electrochemical systems based on their impedance spectra. Electrochemical systems are very diverse. Some of you probably work with batteries, other works with fuel cells, electrolyzers, or biosensors. Nevertheless, impedance spectra of these systems share some common features. For example, the figures in this slide show impedance spectra of a lithium ion battery and of a hydrogen fuel cell. They both have a, tile, a tail at high frequencies followed by an arc. However, the low frequency response is different. Um, the battery spectrum has a straight line, while the fuel cell spectrum has an additional arc that loops back to the horizontal axis. This is because these features correspond to different physical processes. Interpretation of EIS data can be challenging and requires physical knowledge. I have a little story to tell you in that regard. The logo of the 2004 and 2007 International Symposia on Impedance Spectroscopy showed an artistic representation of an impedance spectrum that resembled an elephant. This was a reference to the ancient parable from the Indian subcontinent and a 19th century, a century poem by an American poet, uh, John Godfrey Sachs, called The Blind Man and the Elephant. In this story, a group of blind men approached an elephant and felt the elephant's body to understand what kind of a creature it is. Then they started to argue with one another as each one of them felt a different part of the elephant's body and thus made a different conclusion. These, uh, there are two morals of this story in the context of logic chemical measurements. First, different parts of the impedance spectrum sense different physical processes. So we need to analyze the entire spectrum to see the whole picture. Second, electrochemical systems are black boxes and to fully understand them, we need uh, multiple characterization techniques and not just EIS. Here is the overview of this presentation. We will first take a look at uh, the input and output signals in EIS, including the AC response of basic electrical circuit elements. Through the complex plane representation of AC signals, we will define impedance and see what it looks like for the basic circuit elements. And then we will discuss how to present the impedance data and how to ensure its quality during measurements. After that, we'll take a look at electrical circuits that are necessary to develop some insight and intuition in AIS, and we'll give an example of more advanced physics-based modeling. A brief summary of this presentation will be given at the end. Some slides in, the, in this presentation contain practical tips that will be helpful during the measurement and analysis of impedance data. Those slides are marked with a star. Uh, 
Let's now shift our attention to the fundamentals. I mentioned earlier that electrochemical systems can be thought of as black boxes. What does that mean? The main idea here is that we study the electrochemical system based on the applied signal, the stimulus, and the recorded output signal, the response. We can analyze the electrochemical system by modifying the input signal, observing changes in the output signal, um, and this is the basic idea of the AS, where uh, it's an example of a black box analysis, and the input and output signals are sinusoidal waves in voltage or current. In potential static EIS, the voltage is applied and current is measured. It's the other way around in, in galvanostatic EIS. And the static part in the names of these techniques is due to the fact that the perturbations are applied around the same operating steady state point that we call the DC point. Typically, EIS refers to linear EIS, where the input signal is a sine wave of a single frequency, and the output signal is a phase shifted sine wave of that same frequency. In electrical engineering, uh, cosines are used instead of sines for the reasons we will, we will shortly discuss. But this uh, signal is still called sinusoidal because it can uh, shift between the sines and cosines by um, adding a, a phase of pi over two. Let's discuss the linearity condition. We want the response to be linear because the basic EIS theory was developed under that assumption. Secondly, a linear response is easy to analyze with the fast free transform, for example. Your potential stat or frequency response analyzer does this for you. To achieve a linear response, a small perturbation amplitude is used in the input signal, usually under about 20 millivolts or a few percent of current. This is because even though the voltage current relationship is highly nonlinear, linear approximation works well at small scales. If the amplitude is too large, your voltage and current will deviate too far from the DC point and cause complex behavior with a response that is no longer linear. If the, um, so you can find the optimal amplitude that gives you a linear behavior and yet uh, keeps the noise to signal ratio small by uh, measuring impedance uh, with a different amplitude. Uh, in EIS, you also do not want the system to change too significantly over the course of the uh, measurement. So for example, fast battery discharge or a significant voltage or current drifts are not desired. Nonlinear EIS also exists. Its advantage is that we can apply large amplitude perturbations that reduce the noise to signal ratio. However, nonlinear EIS is more difficult to analyze due to the more complex output. When we speak of EIS, we mean linear EIS. By applying signals of different frequencies, we sense different physical processes taking place in the black box. Depending on the physics, the overall behavior can be resistive, capacitive, or inductive. To understand what that means, we need to see how resistors, capacitors, and inductors respond to AC signals and what physical processes those elements represent. Uh, a resistor is the simplest fundamental circuit element. Its international symbol is a rectangle, and in the US, a different symbol is used that looks like a triangular wave. Resistors in the context of electrochemical measurements I usually mean either uh, ohmic resistance or charge transfer resistance. Ohmic resistance is the resistance to the transport of charge in the material. Uh, it is the ratio of uh, the transport length in a direction of current over the conductivity. And this relationship is valid for a uniform distribution of current and uniform electrodes. Charge uh, transfer resistance is defined as the partial derivative of the kinetic over potential with respect to current density. And in the special case of tidal kinetics, we get this simple relationship for the charge transfer resistance that relates it to the tidal slope B. The defined uh, relationship for a resistor is voltage equals current multiplied by resistance. So assuming a sinusoidal signal in voltage, let's find what the current signal is. By directly using the uh, definition, the defining relationship, we find that the uh, DC current is the static component of voltage divided by the resistance. 
the amplitude is the voltage amplitude divided by the resistance and it's independent of the frequency and the phase of the current signal is the same as the phase of the voltage signal so the phase shift the difference between the voltage phase and the current phase is zero in this case we say that voltage and current are in phase a capacitor is another fundamental circuit element it simply represents parallel plates of a planar capacitor uh, in other chemical systems, the electrical double layer that is formed that interface between the electrode and electrolyte acts as a capacitor. And the defining relationship for a capacitor is current equals the product of capacitance and then the portal derivative of voltage. So assuming a sinusoidal voltage signal, let's find the current. Um, by differentiating the voltage signal, we see that the static component of current is zero. This means that capacitors act as open circuits at steady state. The magnitude of the current amplitude is equal to the product of the angular frequency, capacitance, and the voltage magnitude. And the phase of the current signal, as we get it, is the phase of the voltage signal plus pi over two. So we see that the phase shift is minus 90 degrees. In this case, we say that voltage lags current or current current leads voltage by 90 degrees. Of course, in real systems, we don't have ideal capacitive behavior. In fact, as we will see, the behavior of real systems depends on the frequency of the applied signal. Generally, we say that the system has a capacitive behavior if the phase shift between uh, the two signals is uh, between minus pi over two and zero. An inductor is the third and the final fundamental circuit elements. Its symbol is a coiled wire. In the context of electrochemical systems, inductors may represent the low, fre low frequency uh, dynamics due to the absorbed species at the catalyst surface and the relaxation of intermediates in complex reactions. In, in some systems, such as proton exchange membrane fuel cells, a low frequency dynamics uh, may, may, may also be related to the electrolyte hydration. Inductors are also often used to represent the high frequency interference uh, due to the measurement cables. The defining relationship for inductors states that the voltage equals in inductance multiplied by the temporal derivative of current. So assuming a sinusoidal wave and current, let's find voltage for an inductor. By differentiating the current signal, we find that a static component of voltage is zero for an inductor. This means that inductors act as shorts on the steady state, so they essentially have a zero resistance. Voltage magnitude is a product of angular frequency, inductance, and current magnitude. And the phase of the voltage signal is the phase of the current signal plus pi over 2. So we see that the phase shift in this case is 90 degrees, and we say that voltage leads current or current lags voltage by 90 degrees. In real systems, we say that inductive behavior is when the phase shift is between zero and pi over two. Trigonometric functions are not very nice to work with, especially when it comes to the analysis of electrical circuits. For that reason, in EIS, we use Euler's formula to convert trigonometric functions to exponents that simplify the mathematical analysis. Consider the voltage perturbation at the top of this slide. In EIS, we don't work with sinusoidal waves in their original form that I just mentioned. Instead, we work with their analytic representations. Recalling Euler's formula, we see that analytic representation is a complex number. It has a real part, cosine of phi, and an imaginary part, sine of phi. Here, i is the imaginary unit that satisfies the equation i squared equals to minus one. Um, note that uh, the imaginary unit is not italicized to differentiate it from current density, the italicized i. For the same reason, electrical engineers often use j instead of i for the imaginary unit. At any fixed time, the analytic representation of the sinusoidal signal is a point on a complex plane that lies on a circle with a center at the origin. As time passes, the vector in the complex plane that represents the sine wave rotates around the origin. We can recover the original cosine signal by taking the real part of the analytic representation. By splitting the 
uh, exponent, we separate the static and dynamic component of it. Uh, the static component of the analytic representation of the sinusoidal perturbation is called a phaser. Since AC signals are periodic, we can remove the time completely from our analysis by working with phasers. Note that the phase in the phaser, theta v in this case, usually corresponds to the cosine representation of the perturbation. In some textbooks, you will find uh, the sine representation used for the phasers, and that's completely fine. And as long as you do not mix the representations, you will end up with the correct results, for example, impedance. We're now ready to define impedance. Consider sinusoidal perturbations in voltage and current with their analytic representations and phasers. Impedance can be defined as the ratio of the analytic representations of voltage and current. And as we can see, the dynamic component cancels out. So we end up with a more straightforward definition of impedance, which is the ratio of voltage and current phasers. The units of impedance are ohms, or when current density is used, ohm centimeter square. In electrochemical systems, we often use milli ohm centimeter square. Note that impedance is independent of time. You may find impedance defined as the ratio of voltage and current as time dependent signals in some publications and even textbooks, which I'd like to believe refers to the ratio of the analytic representations. However, uh, you should not write it that way because it's misleading at best and actually wrong. Opening up the exponents in the definition of uh, in, in, in impedance, we see that impedance is a complex number. Its real part is called resistance and is denoted by the real part of Z or Z real, Z prime or R. Its imaginary part is called reactance and is denoted by imaginary part of Z, Z imaginary, Z double prime or X. The, mag the magnitude of impedance is defined uh, using the formula from the complex path that says some of the squares of the real and imaginary parts. The phase angle of the impedance is calculated as the arctangent of the, uh, uh, the ratio of the real and imaginary parts of impedance. And that gives us the phase shift between, between, the, vol between the voltage and current signals. We found earlier how the basic circuit elements behave in AC circuits. Let's find their impedance. First, we will find the impedance of a resistor. With the known voltage and current signals that we established for a resistor earlier, we can find the impedance. By definition, it's the ratio of voltage and current phasers. And by canceling out, uh, we see that impedance of a resistor is simply resistance. It's a purely real uh, impedance. So the real part is R and the imaginary part is zero. The magnitude is also equal to the resistance and the phase shift is zero as we expect for a resistor. Uh, the two graphs here on the right are commonly used to represent impedance spectra. They are called the Nyquist plot and the Bode plot. Um, we will talk about them in detail a bit later. For now, let's just note that impedance of a resistor in the Nyquist plot, which plots the imaginary with a negative sign versus real, is simply a point on the real axis with coordinates R and zero. Because the magnitude and the phase shift are constant, they are um, horizontal lines when plotted versus frequency in the body plot. Now we will uh, find the impedance of a capacitor, which uh, has these voltage and these, uh, these current signals. Um, using the definition of impedance and opening the exponent using Euler's formula, we see that impedance of a capacitor is the negative imaginary uh, unit divided by the angle of frequency and a capacitance, or as it's sometimes written, one over imaginary unit, angle of frequency and capacitance. And this impedance is purely imaginary. It has a zero real part, and this uh, imaginary part is negative. If we take the low frequency limit of the impedance of a capacitor, we'll see that it tends to negative imaginary infinity. This is because again, capacitors act as open circuits at steady state. The high frequency limit of the impedance of a capacitor is zero. Uh, 
which means that capacitors act as shorts at high frequencies. So if you plot the Nyquist plot, we will see that it's a straight line. Again, the zero real and imaginary changes like this. The magnitude of the impedance of a capacitor is simply one over omega C. So if we plot these, the magnitude versus frequency using the log scale for both axes, we will see that it's a straight line with a slope of minus one. The angle uh, of the impedance or the phase shift is minus 90 degrees, so it's constant, so it's minus pi over two in the body plot. Let's consider an inductor now, which has uh, these signals, perm and voltage. Again, using the, the definition of impedance and opening the exponent using Euler's formula, we see that impedance of an inductor is simply the product of the imaginary unit, angular frequency, and inductance. Again, this is a purely inductive, uh, purely imaginary, sorry, uh, impedance. Its real part is zero and its imaginary part is positive. If we take the, high, uh, the low frequency limit of the impedance of uh, an inductor, we see that it's zero. So inductors at steady state act as shorts. On the other hand, at high frequencies, because the impedance tends to the uh, imaginary infinity, they act as open circuits. If you plot this in the Nyquist plot, it's a straight line again. Um, the magnitude of the impedance of an inductor is the product of angular frequency and inductance. If you plot this in the Bode plot, so magnitude versus frequency with a log scale for both, then it's a straight line with a slope of one. The phase shift is in this case 90 degrees, so it's a constant phase in the body plot. Even though the impedance expressions for the resistors, capacitors, and inductors are different, we don't need to worry about the type of the circuit elements when we find the overall impedance of electrical circuits. Impedance of AC circuits is calculated the same way as the resistance of DC circuits. You sum impedances in series and you sum the reciprocal of impedances in parallel. Now that we know what impedance is, we can look at impedance spectra and how they are represented. Impedance is independent of time, but it depends on frequency. Impedance spectrum is a collection of impedance points measured at the range of frequencies. To sense all possible time scales, we would need to scan between zero hertz and infinity. However, the time scales of real chemical system lie in a much narrower and finite range. Also, we have limitations uh, associated with our equipment capabilities and the length of the experiment. For example, to sense zero hertz, you would need infinite amount of time. So in practice, an hour frequency range is used, for example, from 10 millihertz to 10 kilohertz. So how do we present impedance data? The most common way to present impedance data is to show the Nyquist plot, also called the cold cold plot, which graphs the imaginary uh, component with a negative sign versus the real component uh, of the spectrum. And we will see later the shape of the spectrum um, sometimes is important for the analysis of our other chemical system. To preserve the correct shape of the spectrum, the axis of the Nyquist plot must be orthonormed, which means they should have the same um, scale for the unit of the measurement in the y and x directions. Nyquist plots separate the capacitive and inductive behavior. The capacitive behavior is when the imaginary part is negative and inductive when the imaginary part is positive. Again, remember that the y-axis is reversed. Um, the, these graphs, the Nyquist plots, also show the characteristic frequencies of the system. When the system exhibits a finite uh, resistance at the low frequency limit that we call the DC resistance, for example, in fuel cells, um, this DC resistance matches the slope of the polarization curve, uh, the magnitude of it, at the DC point, so at the point where we measure our EIS. On the other hand, the high frequency limit that we call the high frequency resistance uh, is the metric of uh, omic resistance of the sum of the cell components. Which cell components depends on the system. For example, the HFR could be the resistance of the electrolyte between the two uh, electrodes 
Nyquist plots do not show the frequency composition. As you can see, there is no frequency here. Um, for that reason, they are ambiguous on their own. Similarly looking, Nyquist plots may correspond to systems with different frequency compositions. To show the frequency composition of the spectrum, the so-called body plots are commonly used. They are the graphs of the magnitude of impedance versus frequency and the phase angle versus frequency. Sadly, frequency composition is often not reported in the literature, which makes it impossible to analyze the Nyquist plots. Remember, impedance is a function of frequency. It's recommended that you provide both Nyquist and body plots in publications. Capacitive and inductive behaviors uh, can be separated from the body plots as well. In this case, we look at the sign of the phase angle. Uh, the phase angle between minus 90 degrees and zero is capacitive, and between zero and 90 degrees is inductive. A convenient but less common way to report the frequency composition of impedance spectra is to use the graph of the negative impedance component and uh, versus frequency. It is easily related to the Nyquist plot when the two graphs are placed side by side. As in the Nyquist plot, the capacitive and inductive parts of the spectra are identified based on the sign of the imaginary part of impedance. It is considered a good practice to report the complete information about the OAS experiment, including the EIS mode, potentiostatic or galvanostatic, the DC point, that is the voltage and the current at which you measure your EIS, and for batteries, the position in the charge-discharge curves. You also should report the amplitude of the signal, the frequency range and the sweep direction, for example, from high to low frequencies or from low to high frequencies, as well as the number of frequencies per decade, that is a number of points between say 0.1 and 1 hertz, 1 hertz and 10 hertz, uh, and so on, and the overall number of points in the spectrum, for example, 1000 frequencies per spectrum. It is also important to show error bars in the uh, to report uh, it is also important to uh, show error bars to uh, prove that your data is repeatable. I tried to find impedance spectra with error bars in the literature to show in this slide, but ended up having to use a finger from one of our group publications. This doesn't mean that error bars are never reported. It just shows how rarely that's really done. Always report the measured spectra in the form of the Nyquist plot with orthonorm axis and place a Bowie plot or the plot of the imaginary component versus frequency next to it. This will make it possible for the readers of your work to uh, process your EIS data. If you cannot do so due to some journal restrictions, uh, provide the frequency composition graphs in appendix or in supplementary information. In that case, label some characteristic frequencies in the Nyquist plot as shown here. Measuring reliable impedance data can be challenging. However, there are some tips and tricks you could use to improve the quality of the measured impedance spectra. To perform EIS, we need the system and study to satisfy these criteria. We require linearity, causality, and stability. Linearity uh, was discussed a bit earlier. So it's when the system exhibits a linear response to the excitation. For example, when we have a single frequency input, is going to be a single frequency output. Causality means that excitation cannot precede the response, and the response is related to the excitation signal only. Stability means that the response cannot grow uncontrollably, and when we stop the excitation, the system returns to the initial state. Physical systems are causal, so we don't need to worry about this criterion. What about linearity and stability? Well, some potential start software comes with some built-in uh, quality metrics for the criteria above. Usually, these criteria are verified using the so-called Kramers Kronig transform that is also available in the software. The Kramers Kronig transform allows one to reconstruct the real part of impedance from the imaginary part and vice versa. The commonly used form of the KKT is shown in this slide. As you can see, it involves integration of experimental uh, data. And because experimental data is discrete, it needs to be interpolated using, for example, splines to be integrated. The reconstructed spectrum 
is then obtained and is compared to the original spectrum and the errors can be quantified. The difficulty here is that we need the entire frequency range between zero hertz and infinity to use the KKD, and we don't have the entire range in experiments. Uh, the common way to overcome this difficulty is to fit the spectrum with an equivalent circuit, and we will discuss this shortly. Then you compute the fitted impedance at a wide range of frequencies and perform KKT of that spectrum. As I mentioned, steady state should be ideally achieved before the IS measurement. However, in practice, the, op the operating voltage current point may shift or may drift in time causing, especially at low frequencies, distortion of the spectrum and uh, deviation between back-to-back -back measurements, as shown here for, the, for, the, for a lithium-ion battery. If your potential stack comes with an option for drift correction during EIS, enable it to improve the quality of the measurement. You should still try uh, to stabilize your signals before the EIS measurement because the drift correction capabilities of the software are limited. Another common issue in EIS measurements is the parasitic inductance due to the electromagnetic interference in the potential stat cables. It's typically stronger at high frequencies, but can also propagate to medium frequencies in some systems. To reduce this effect, you can use shielded cables. Uh, remember to not coil long cables, twist the cables around each other, and place your cell in a Faraday cage. Not all of these measures are uh, are, can, be, can always be undertaken, and the parasitic inductance still may appear in the measured spectrum. To correct for it, you need to first quantify the parasitic impedance. There are two ways to do so. In the first method shown in this, uh, in this slide, you measure the short circuit impedance by short circuiting your anode and cathode contents. Then you measure your cell impedance, and you subtract the short circuit impedance from your cell impedance to get the corrected impedance spectrum. In the second method that I will discuss, uh, discuss a bit shortly when we look at the electrical circuits, the high frequency portion of the spectrum is fitted with an equivalent circuit, and then the corresponding impedance is removed. Uh, because um, the interference strength will change every time you change the uh, configuration of your equipment. And even when you turn on and off some of the um, powerful electrical equipment around your test bench, you need to redo uh, this to re-measure um, the inductive interference before every single experiment, or at least every time configuration changed. This uh, induction correction is important, especially when you are trying to measure the HFR to estimate some of the ohmic resistances in your cell. As I mentioned, the HFR may correspond to different cell components in different systems. Um, as you can see here, the measured HFR in the correct spectrum might be quite different from the HFR in the interference spectrum. This illustrates the importance of the inductance correction. Some more tips for AES measurement are provided in this slide. When you perform EIS, always scan from high to low frequencies. This will lead to a more accurate spectrum as this high frequency part is less sensitive to the voltage or current drift simply due to the shorter time scales. Extend uh, the frequency limits in your experiment beyond the expected frequency limits of your system. This will allow, especially at high frequencies, um, the a quantification of the in inductive interference and the correction of your impedance spectrum. You should verify the DC point, the pair of volts and current at which you measured your EIS with an independent experiment, for example, a polarization curve when it's available, just to make sure that your cell has stabilized to the expected point uh, in the EIS. You should also verify the DC resistance, which is the low frequency limit of your impedance and make sure that it matches the magnitude of the slope of the pole curve when it's available. Note, however, that measuring the DC resistance may sometimes be challenging due to the high nose to signal ratio at low frequencies. You can also verify the high frequency resistance um, by comparing it to some 
uh, estimated ohmic resistance of your cell uh, from some independent measurements. Uh, you can uh, obtain the HFR after you correct the spectrum for the parasitic inductance. You should also perform the AS measurements uh, in the direction of increasing voltage current, then decreasing voltage current with two to three back-to-back -back, uh, scans in each case. Average the data and calculate standard deviation at each frequency. Honestly, there are too many publications with a single spectrum with no error bars. We now move on to the analysis of impedance spectra with equivalent electrical circuits. I'll go deeper here as thinking of electrochemical systems as electrical circuits is sometimes insightful and helps develop valuable intuition. We also know that we need equivalent circuits for the Kramers chronic transform. Equivalent electrical circuits or EECs are the most common way for analyzing impedance spectra of electrochemical systems. In this approach, uh, you would first select an appropriate equivalent circuit for your cell based on some considerations that I will discuss uh, later, find the impedance as a function of frequency and the operating, uh, and, sorry, and the components of your spectrum, uh, of, your, of your circuit. Uh, and then you will fit that expression to the measured data. Errors of the fit are usually calculated in the form relative to the magnitude of the impedance. If the circuit is adequate, the fitting will provide the resistances, capacitances, and inductances that correspond to the physical properties of the cell. To build an adequate equivalent circuit and to correctly interpret the fitted parameters, one needs to understand some basic ECs and their physical meaning. I will discuss that next. So let's look at some common equivalent logical circuits that involve capacitive elements, and we will start with the Randall circuit. Consider an, el an electrochemical reaction at the surface of an electrode in contact with electrolyte. The system is modeled with the Randall cell, also called the Randall circuit. Uh, it has uh, an, a resistor in series with a parallel RC circuit. The resistor here represents the electrolyte resistance, and the RC circuit represents the Faradayic reaction and the double layer effects. RCT here is the charge transfer resistance due to the electrochemical reaction, and CDL is a double layer capacitance. How do you find impedance in this circuit? Well, as we discussed before, impedance of AC circuits is calculated the same way as resistance of DC circuits. So we easily get the formula here. I will show now how to analyze the impedance of this simple circuit to illustrate the general process that you can then apply to any circuit. Based on our previous discussion, the impedance of each resistor is in the Randall cell is equal to the corresponding resistance. And the impedance of the capacitor is one over uh, imaginary unit multiplied by the angular frequency and the double layer capacitance. By substituting, we get this result for the impedance of this circuit. However, this is not the final answer. It's not very easy to analyze because we have not separated the real and imaginary parts. What we want is impedance in the so-called rectangular form that says real part plus I imaginary part. We note that in the denominator, we have an imaginary number uh, as one plus something. If you multiply, if you multiply this fraction and divide it by the complex conjugate of this imaginary number, which is the same as this number, but with the opposite sign of the imaginary part, in this case, one minus I omega CR, then we can separate the real and imaginary parts using some math. So in this case, we get this formula here. As you can see, the real part is separated from the imaginary part. What does this impedance spectrum look like in this case? Let's note that the imaginary part is negative. So the impedance is capacitive as we discussed before. Taking the zero frequency limit, gives us uh, the DC resistance. Um, and if, if you look at the circuit, if we take the low frequency limit, right, the uh, capacitor will act as open circuit. So no current will go through this part of this open circuit. So we'll, we will see the two resistors. So that explains why our low frequency limit is the sum of the electrolyte and charge transfer resistances. The DC reactance, on the other hand, the imaginary component at the low frequencies gives us zero. At the high frequencies, on the other hand, capacitors act as shorts. So what we will see is this path of current 
and we will only have the electrolyte resistance as our HFR. The high frequency resistance in this case is zero. So we can see that the Randall circuit has a Nyquist plot that bends to the real axis at both low frequency and high frequency limits. And if we plot it, we will see that it looks like a semicircle. The HFR is our electrolyte in the di uh, diameter of this semicircle is equal to the charge transfer resistance. The apex of this point has a tangent with a zero slope. And if we use that fact, we can actually calculate the frequency of this apex point and has a simple formula. It's the reciprocal of the time constant, which is the product of the charge transfer resistance and double air capacitance. This allows for the graphical analysis of impedance spectra that resemble ideal semicircles. First, you can estimate the electrolyte resistance from the high frequency resistance. Then from the diameter of the spectrum, you get the charge transfer resistance. And with a known RCT, you can find the double layer capacitance from the frequency of the apex point. However, uh, the Randall cell is a simplified model that is subject to many assumptions. For instance, it assumes no impedance contribution from the reference electrode, so it only presents the working electrode. The Randall cell is also only valid for uh, simple electrode structures, for instance, for a single resistive layer, and also it's valid for no mass transport limitations. So for, for when no mass transport limitations occur. The Randall cell also does not account for the ohmic resistance of the electrode and for the non-uniform current distribution in the electrode, with both factors important when we deal with porous electrodes. Let's see how the equivalent circuit changes when these assumptions uh, cannot be used. Let's see what uh, we can do when our spectra exhibit multiple time constants. For instance, what happens if I have two electrodes, a reference counter one and a working electrode, or when I have a single electrode with two resistive layers, such as a lithium iron, ion conducting ceramic? Well, in these cases, I can use two parallel RC circuits. The circuit on the left represents uh, two electrodes separated by an electrolyte. This circuit uh, could be related to fuel cells or electrolyzers, for example. The circuit on the right uh, corresponds to uh, a lithium ion conducting ceramic that has uh, a grain um, and a grain boundary, it has two resistive layers. Let's see what the impedance looks like in the example on the left. Because the two electrodes are in series, we simply add another um, RC impedance to the Randall cell impedance that we obtained before, and we get this impedance expression. The Nyquist plot of this circuit has two semicircles or two time constants, one for each electrode. The closer the two time constants are to each other, the more two semicircles overlap. If they overlap too much, the graphical analysis cannot be performed because this formula will not hold anymore. And also the positions of the apex points will not be clear. In that case, experimental spectra are fitted with a known impedance expression such as this one to uh, extract the properties of the circuit elements. As I mentioned earlier, the Randall circuit needs to be modified to account for mass transfer. Let's see how that is done. When mass transport cannot be neglected, a so-called Warburg element is added to the circuit. There are three common types of Warburg elements for different scenarios, regular Warburg, bounded Warburg, and open Warburg. The regular Warburg element, or simply the Warburg element, uh, is used in the case of semi-infinite diffusion. For example, when you have electrolyte around a submerged electrode. The real and imaginary parts of the Warburg impedance, um, they are proportional to sigma over the square root of the angle frequency where sigma is the Warburg coefficient that's related to the concentrations and diffusion coefficients of the transported species. Uh, What's interesting about the Warburg impedance is that it's always derived from the physical equations. Um, so it relates the physical properties of your materials uh, to impedance. The exact expression for sigma in this case depends on the problem at hand, and the examples for it can be found in the reference at the bottom. Uh, 
um, with the, in series with the resistance, um, the Warwick element produces an Nyquist plot that is a straight line at 45 degrees with respect to the real axis. When we combine the Warwick element uh, and we put uh, with the Randall circuit, then we will end up with a 45 degree low frequency tail as compared uh, in, in our impedance spectrum as compared with just a single uh, semicircle in the normal Randall uh, Randall's cell. The spectrum on the right, so this shape here, resembles impedance spectra of lithium ion batteries where the low frequency tail is related to the diffusion of lithium ions. Batteries are, of course, finite in size, but when diffusion is slow, the diffusion domain can be considered semi-infinite and the Warburg element can be used. In some systems, diffusion length is comparable uh, to the finite thickness of the transport domain, and the regular Warburg element cannot be used. For the finite diffusion with transmissive boundary conditions, when we have, for example, constant concentrations, a bounded Warburg is introduced. An example for the use of the bounded Warburg element is diffusion through a conducting, uh, sorry, it's, it's a diffusion through a film coating an electrode. And in this case, at the interface between the electrolyte and film, we have an exchange of concentration. The bounded Warburg element, whose impedance is given in this slide, is then used for this case where R0 is a structural parameter that depends on the film thickness. The bounded Warburg element produces a shape similar to a semicircle, but with a 45 degree high frequency um, slope in the Nyquist graph. When combined with the Randall circuit to account for the electrochemical kinetics, we end up with two semicircles with the Warburg semicircle having this 45 degree slope at the higher frequencies. When there is no exchange of the transported species at one side, we have reflective or no flux bounding conditions. In that case, open Warburg, uh, also called reflective Warburg, is used. Its expression depends on the problem at hand. For example, impedance of associated with a proton uh, transport in a catalyst layer of a proton exchange membrane fuel cell in the absence of fire diode reactions is given here on this slide. Although this is not an example of gas diffusion, uh, proton transport is described by Ohm's law, which is similar to Frick's law of diffusion and results in a Warburg-like impedance. I will share these slides with you later uh, so that you can see the derivation of this Warburg impedance from Ohm's law in the extra slides. Or you could go to reference number two to see the derivation. Um, the Nyquist plot of the open Warburg looks like uh, this with a 45 degree slope at high frequencies and it has a vertical branch at a lower frequencies. Uh, and when combined in the, uh, with the Randall uh, cell, it adds this tail at lower frequencies. And if the time constants corresponding to the, uh, our reactions and uh, to Warburg are similar, you will not see the 45 degree slope. This graph here compares the bin spectra of the three Warburg elements. They all exhibit the 45 degree slope at high frequencies, but the low frequency behavior changes depending on the physics. The Randall circuit applies to planar or homogeneous electrodes. What do we do when the electrode structure is more complex? The frequency response of an electrode can be affected by multiple factors, such as surface roughness, varying thickness, non-uniform electrode composition, and non-uniform distribution of current. To account for these effects, we often replace capacitors in our equivalent circuits with constant phase elements, or CPEs. The symbol for a CPE is similar to a capacitor, but instead of uh, parallel plates, it uses these triangular plates. Um, a CPE is a generalized electrical element whose impedance is given by this expression here. And it's generalized because the behavior depends on this parameter alpha. When alpha is one, we get a pure capacitor. When alpha is, for example, 0.5, we get semi intimate Warburg. For alpha of zero, we get resistance. For alpha of minus one, we get inductance. So as you can see, it's anything between a pure capacitor and a pure inductor. And the Nyquist plot of the CPE is a straight line. Uh, we, 
with an angle with respect to real uh, axis that changes from 90 degrees to minus 90 degrees as alpha goes from one to minus one. Because the slope uh, or the phase of impedance is constant in this case, well, that's why the name, constant phase element. The spectrum of a parallel RCPE circuit for the electrochemical reactions again, has a shape of a depressed uh, semicircle and approaches the real axis at the angle alpha 90 degrees. So if the ideal semicircle had an angle of 90 degrees, this has alpha 90 degrees. This is another reason why Nyquist plots should always have orthonormed axis. If the shape of your spectrum differs from an ideal semicircle, you know your electrode has some, has some non-uniformity, either structural or phenomenological. Just like the, the Randall's circuit, the uh, circuits involving CPEs allow for the graphical analysis. The diameter of the Nyquist plot is equal to the charge transfer resistance, and the frequency of the apex is have, it has a bit simple formula that depends on the circuit parameters. Okay, so how do we uh, extract the true capacitance from the CPE? Well, remember that the parameter Q in the CPE is not the double layer capacitance. Uh, it even has different units. Several methods for extracting the true capacitance exist. For example, you could argue that the characteristic frequencies of a CPE and of an equivalent capacitor should match. Then you get this formula for the double layer capacitance. On the other hand, uh, in, the, in a different approach that was suggested recently, um, we, we take a look at the impedance spectrum of a CPE and we note that it, it, it is an ideal semicircle, but tilted. Um, in this case, the double layer capacitance is equal to this formula that is the same as before, but with a sign of alpha pi over two that comes from the projection of the diameter here are effective to the charge transfer resistance. In the third method, we equate the CPE impedance at the apex frequency of the CPE to the uh, capacitor impedance um, uh, at the same frequency with, well, not the impedances themselves, the impedances themselves but the uh, squares of their uh, magnitudes. And this equation, if we open this up, gives us this formula for the double layer capacitance, which is different from what we got before. And even more methods exist. Uh, however, uh, even though we have these uh, equations here, first of all, as I said, they are different. And the correct way to extract capacitance is still under debate. These results uh, in the slides uh, were tested in reference to one and two with uh, the parameter of alpha of 0.8 to point, uh, from 0.8 to one, which is close to ideal capacitor anyway. So I'm not, I'm not sure why they chose to validate this with this alpha. And also, if you look at these formulas, why would the double layer capacitance depend on the charge transfer resistance, which is the fire diac process? Um, another way to represent porous electrodes and conduct polymers is as the transmission line model or TLM. TLMs are infinite circuits consisting of infinitesimal elements representing the distributed properties of the sample. TLMs are often used when the sample is non-uniform or when the current distribution is non-uniform. The optimal finite number of the TLM links can be found by fitting the experimental data with TLMs of different size. EIS analysis software supplied with RetentionStat often comes with an option to build TLMs and to automatically compute their impedance. Transmission line models are different for different systems. An example shown in this slide corresponds to the 1D transport of charge in a catalyst layer of a polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell. These, this catalyst layer has an electronically conductive platinum carbon phase and a protonically conductive uh, polymer electrolyte phase. The TLM in this case has the top rail that corresponds to proton transport. It is connected on the left side with the 
um, it's connected to the proton conducting membrane, but on the other side, it terminates because the vacuum layer does not conduct protons. On the other hand, the bottom rail that represents electron transport is connected to the backing layer that conducts electrons, but terminates at the membrane that does not conduct electrons. These two rails are connected to each other through the electrode process, through the surface processes. Um, so we have these parallel RC circuits that have charge transfer resistances and double layer capacitances. If in this TLM we assume no mass transport limitations, we assume uh, no or very low Faraday current so that the charge transfer resistance is very large. And we assume high electronic conductivity. So basically these resistances are zero. We will end up with a circuit that only has these protonic resistances and these distributed capacitances. This infinite circuit corresponds to the, or to, to the open Warburg element. And if we derive the impedance expression for the proton transport in the catalyst layer will end up under these assumptions with this expression over here for the uniform electrode. And because this is an open Warburg, we end up with a Nyquist plot that is now familiar to us. So the 45 degree high frequency slope and the low frequency vertical branch. As I said, this is only for the uniform case. If we have any non-uniformity in our electrode, the shape will be different. For example, if we have a linear distribution of uh, protonic resistance or protonic conductivity, and then we end up with, these, with this graph here, where the slope of the high uh, frequency branch is different from 45 degrees. You can fit uh, your measure spectra with TLMs to analyze the non-uniformity of your samples. So far, we've looked at the capacitive circuits. Let's discuss some inductive phenomena now. Impedance spectra of resistor capacitor uh, circuits and resistor inductive circuits are similar, except we have positive imaginary components for inductives. In parallel, we also end up with similar circuits, just uh, flipped basically. Um, because the uh, inductive impedance grows as frequency increases, as you can see here from this circuit, in this circuit, impedance of the uh, inductor will grow as frequency increases and our current will just flow through this resistor, which means our spectrum will curve back to the real axis because we will just see the pure resistor. So uh, if uh, the high frequency uh, limit of the RC circuit was on the left, for the RL circuits, the high frequency limit is on the right. As we discussed before, electromagnetic interference in cables may result in an inductive impedance at high frequencies. In some cases, as in the case shown here, uh, the inductive tail is not orthogonal to the rail axis and, can be, and cannot be fitted with an ideal capacitor. In this case, a modified inductor is used with this formula for, these, for its impedance. Like constant phase elements, modified inductors are generalized uh, elements, and they are actually equivalent to the CPEs with this exp these uh, expressions here, and therefore they are less common. In fact, uh, you will find sometimes CPUs, CPEs used instead to describe inductive processes. However, it uh, is a good idea to limit the parameters alpha and beta in the CPE and modified inductor impedance so that the C uh, to the range between zero and one, so that the CPEs and modified inductors only have capacitive and inductive behavior respectively. This will clearly uh, show the role you're assigning to the respective element in your circuit. To account for the parasitic high frequency inductance in your spectra, you can connect a modified inductor in series to the circuit representing uh, your system. You can then fit the measured spectrum with the impedance of this circuit. In the example shown in this slide, the impedance data can uh, um, the, the impedance data exhibited the high frequency tail that was not orthogonal to the real axis. The two fits shown here in the table and in the graphs correspond to the, uh, to the ideal inductor, uh, in, in which case we fixed parameter beta 
at the value of one. And in the second case, we allowed um, for this parameter beta to be uh, fitted as well. And we got a much better fit. Uh, subtracting the fitted impedance of the modified inductor from your spectrum will correct your data for the interference. Some systems exhibit inductive behavior at low frequencies that, unlike the high frequency interference, is directly related to the electrochemical cell. In this slide, a Faraday impedance spectrum of a direct methanol fuel cell is shown. The authors of the paper that I took this paper, uh, that I took this figure from, uh, they hypothesized that the inductive behavior was due to the carbon monoxide absorption on the catalyst surface. The equivalent circuit that they used is shown at the bottom. What they did is that they added a resistor and an inductor representing uh, the carbon monoxide absorption um, in parallel with the charge transfer resistance. As you can see from the top finger, this resulted in a relatively good fit of the measured spectrum. This example illustrates how inductive elements can be used to model low frequency inductive loops. Now we'll briefly introduce a technique called distribution of relaxation times that can help design equivalent circuit elements, uh, sorry, that can help design equivalent circuits. To build an adequate equivalent logical circuit, one needs to know the rough number of time constants in the impedance spectrum. However, it is not always easy to visually identify the number of time constants in real life impedance spectra that often have a complex shape, such as uh, the spectrum of a hydrogen fuel cell shown in this slide. If we have enough circuit elements, we will be able to fit any spectrum. But how do we know how many elements to use without overfitting our data? If we overfit, we will lose the physical meaning, right? This can be achieved with the approach called distribution of relaxation times, or DRT. Its idea is as follows. If we have one parallel RC circuit in uh, series with, with HFR, then we have this impedance that has a single, time constant equal, a single time constant equal to the RC of this parallel RC circuit. If we have N RC circuits in, um, connected to each other in series, then we have this impedance expression with n time constants equal to the individual RC products of these circuits. If we have an infinite number of RC circuits, then we can represent our impedance as this integral over here, where gamma is the distribution function. By solving the reverse problem, which is not easy to do mathematically, uh, the DRT gamma is obtained. Um, this is uh, yeah, so the DRT gamma is obtained. And um, as you can see from the middle figure, the DRT separates the time scales more clearly than the uh, body or the uh, frequency composition plots. The nice thing about the DRT is that to uh, extract the number of uh, time constant, you don't need to know anything about equivalent circuits. But now once you've done this, um, you can uh, design an equivalent electrical circuit for your system. For example, the authors of this paper, they came up with this equivalent circuit. The first two elements correspond to the non-zero inductive interference at high frequencies and the HFR seen in the Nyquist plot. Then we have two parallel RCP circuits representing the two electrodes in our system with the R1 and R2 being our charge transfer resistances. Then we can see here there's a, uh, there were, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. So we have in this graph, as you can see, three capacitive processes and two inductive processes, right? So that's why they have five elements here that produce um, capacitive or inductive phenomena. So the two processes here, as we discussed uh, here, were assigned to the um, electrodes. But the third process here was assigned to a diffusion. So we have this work element in the middle. And the last two processes were inductive. So they were modeled also with the RCP uh, circuits, but the negative resistances were used to achieve um, like an inductive behavior. Although the circuit fits the spectrum quite nicely, this is an example where the physical meaning of the fitted parameters is not clear. For instance, if the Warburg impedance 
uh, here uh, represents diffusion in one of the electrodes. Why was it not included in the RCP circuit as we saw before, right? Secondly, what is the physical meaning of the negative resistances R3 and R4 that were used to model the inductive process? And why were, were these inductive processes separated from the electrode? Um, remember that for the fitted parameters to be relatable to the cell properties, you need to use a physically meaningful circuit. However, uh, what we just discussed is not a shortcoming of the DRT, which is still a useful technique for separating time constants. One limitation of the DRT is that it can only be applied when the imaginary impedance is zero at high and low frequency limits. For that reason, the DRT is currently gaining popularity in fuel cell EIS and is not as common for battery EIS. Application to batteries is possible, um, but the low frequency diffusion branch here needs to be fitted with an equivalent circuit and removed prior to the DRT analysis, as shown uh, in this slide for an impedance spectrum of a lithium iron phosphate battery. Due to the DRT limitations, the high frequency parasitic inductance also needs to be removed from the spectrum by either measuring the short circuit impedance or feeding the measured spectrum with an inductive circuit, as we discussed before. In summary, we can analyze uh, impedance spectra by fitting them with an appropriately designed equivalent logical circuit. Let's discuss advantages and disadvantages of this approach. As I mentioned earlier, equivalent electrical circuit analysis is the most common way of interpreting electrochemical impedance spectra, and not without a reason. Uh, AECs are relatively easy to analyze. They are illustrative and somewhat intuitive, which makes them a convenient tool for getting the initial insight. They are especially convenient for predicting the behavior at high frequencies and low frequencies. Also, equivalent uh, circuits can be used to remove the parasitic inductance from the measured spectra and to pre-process them for the Kramers chronic transform or for the distribution of relaxation times analysis. One drawback of equivalent circuits is that they are ambiguous. There can be many different circuits representing the same electrochemical system, and they may even exhibit the same impedance spectra. How do you know which circuit to use, right? The physical meaning of the equivalent circuit elements may be questionable. For example, how do you relate the parameter Q of the constant phase element with these weird units uh, to the measurable properties of the cell? And uh, how, uh, what's the physical meaning of the negative resistance that is used to fit the low frequency inductive phenomena in some systems? Furthermore, uh, the fitted circuit parameters are only valid in the close neighborhood of the operating point that you measured your spectra. If you change the operating conditions, the circuit parameters need to be refitted. This leads to the last shortcoming in this list. Equivalent circuits have no predictive capabilities. Equivalent electrical circuits are like control models. You come up with a simplified circuit that has the same AC response as your physical cell. Uh, a different class of models called physical models aims at first and foremost, simulating the physical phenomena taking place in the cell. And the accurate impedance response comes as a consequence of the accurate phenomenological representation of the cell. In contrast to equivalent electrical circuits, physical models are used to generate impedance spectra by solving a set of governing equations that describes the physical phenomena that take place in electrochemical systems. These equations can be solved analytically and numerically and depending on the problem at hand, you are free to choose the dimensionality of your model. Uh, multiple dimensions in equivalent circuits are also possible, but they come at the cost of extra fitting parameters, which adds to the ambiguity of uh, the circuits. Because electrochemical systems are very different, the equations describing them are also different. There is no general model. Um, there are many publications with physical models of electrochemical systems. In this presentation, I will briefly illustrate the uh, physical modeling of a proton exchange membrane fuel cell, or PMFC, that's based on some of our group's work. First, I will give a brief summary of what a proton exchange membrane fuel cell is. In this electrochemical system, the hydrogen-fed porous anode and the oxygen-fed porous cathode 
are separated with a polymer electrolyte, a proton exchange membrane. In the anode, hydrogen oxidation reaction occurs, and in the cathode, oxygen reduction reaction takes place. Protons produced in the anode uh, are transported through the membrane to be consumed in the cathode. To transport protons to and from the reaction sites, anode and cathode catalyst layers are impregnated with a proton conducting polymer called ionomer. Conductivity of the membrane and of the ionomer in the catalyst layers uh, depends on their hydration level. Water for hydration comes from the humidified reactant streams and as a product of the cathodic reaction. Electrolyte hydration is a dynamic process and it affects the transient response of a fuel cell. So we have a reason to believe that it will affect the uh, impedance spectra of fuel cells as well. Um, as we saw earlier in this presentation, impedance spectra of proton chain membrane fuel cells may exhibit a low frequency inductive behavior. Uh, for example, uh, Schiffer et al. analyzed their um, uh, experimental fuel cell impedance spectra with the distribution of relaxation times and came up with this circuit that we just discussed. However, DRT and equivalent circuits do not reveal the underlying physics. Even though the experimental data uh, showed the strong influence of the relative humidity on the inductive phenomenon, the latter was attributed to dynamics of platinum oxide and ORR intermediates. Physics-based models can help shed light on the experimental observations that hint at the dependence of the low frequency inductive behavior on dynamic electrolyte hydration. In fact, we reproduced the relative humidity study of Schiffer et al. with our numerical model in, in our paper and showed that their observations could be explained with electrolyte hydration. The model that we, uh, that we used to analyze the fuel cell impedance spectra as shown on the slide, I will not go into the details about this model. They can be found in the reference at the bottom. I'll just say that it described the uh, mass transport charge transport, uh, transport of water in the electrolyte, and uh, thermal transport. Uh, transient simulations or impedance sim uh, spectroscopy simulations were applied, sorry, were uh, performed by applying a time-dependent voltage at the interface between the uh, cathode and the rib of the bipolar plate. And impedance was computed in post-processing based on the known voltage input and the simulated current density output. The model was sold numerically using our in-house uh, code, uh, OpenFCHC, which is open source. One of our studies that we conducted was investigating how the finite rate exchange of water between the electrolyte and the pore phase affects fuel cell inductance. As shown in the Nyquist and the frequency composition plots on the right, the low frequency inductive behavior uh, depends on the dynamic electrolyte hydration. When the water exchange was made slow in the model or when it was fast and vapor transport was fast, no inductive behavior was observed as water did not move in the electrolyte and did not change the electrolyte conductivity, which remained constant and uniform. The two-dimensional model allows for the visualization of the water content distribution in the catalyst layers and in the membrane as shown at the bottom left. We also conducted a different study where we analyzed the effect of water transport inside of the electrolyte on, on the fuel cell inductance, but I will not get uh, into that in the, in the interest of time. So we're now approaching the end of this presentation. I've outlined some of the main tips for the EIS measurement. It's important to minimize the voltage and current drift during the EIS measurement, otherwise your low frequency spectrum will not be reliable. You also need to use sufficiently small perturbations for your response to be linear. The optimal perturbation magnitude depends on your equipment and the tested system. Conductor measurements at sufficiently high frequency to be able to estimate the parasitic conductance due to the interference and to remove it from your spectrum. For this, you can either measure the open circuit impedance or use circuit fitting. Verify linearity and stability using Kramers chronic transform. The EIS software supplied with your equipment may have additional quality metrics. Use them. Don't forget to perform repeatability tests. When reporting EIS data, include all details of the measurement and data processing, such as KKD, DRT, and interference correction. The reader uh, should be able to follow your procedure. Report both Nyquist and Body 
plots or plots of the uh, in negative margin of frequency versus sorry of the negative margin impedance versus frequency. Um, use uh, an orthonormed axis for the Nyquist plot, so the same scale in the x and y axis. A good experimental paper always has error bars in the figures. This proves the predictability of our data. When analyzing EIS data, use physical models when you can. They directly correlate the impedance spectrum features to physical processes. Use um, as few elements in electrical circuits as possible to avoid feeling ambiguity. Distribution of relaxation times uh, can help you choose an appropriate number of circuit elements. Pick the elements that are most suitable for your system. In this slide, I listed some of the materials that might help you in your work in the area of EIS. The first three references were used extensively in this presentation. They cover uh, the general EIS theory and contain many practical examples. The fourth reference is a book chapter that focuses specifically on porous electrodes. The fifth reference is a YouTube lecture on EIS basics that nicely complements this presentation, so I suggest you watch it. These five references will get you started and will help you understand the EIS publications in your specific field. If you are an experimentalist, it also will help you uh, get a good idea um, of, sorry, if you are an experimentalist, uh, it's also a good idea to read the uh, application notes from the manufacturer of your potential stats uh, that are related to EIS. This will help you improve the quality of your measurements and will teach you how to process the EIS data using the software supplied with your equipment. I'd like to finish my presentation by acknowledging my friends and colleagues at the Energy System Design Laboratory at the University of Alberta. A significant part of this presentation is based on what I've learned about the IES during my uh, PhD under the supervision of Professor Mark Sicanel. I also learned some practical aspects of EIS while working with experimentalists in the lab, namely Luis Padi Urbina and Fei Wei. So thank you for your attention and thank you again to the University of Waterloo Electrochemical Society student chapter for inviting me to give this lecture. I hope that you found this presentation useful and if you have any questions, feel free to ask now or email me at the address on this slide. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Aslan. That was a great insightful talk definitely learned a lot about EIS in that uh, presentation. So um, yeah, really, really excited to have had you present. Um, so I guess now I'll open up the floor to questions for anybody. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so uh, you could feel free to post any questions that you may have in the chat. Um, and yeah, I'll keep an eye out and I can read them to you, Aslan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you very much. So, so far, I don't see any questions, uh, but I guess I, I have a, a bit of a practical question in how these um, EIS measurements could work. So for people working on flow systems, I mean, fuel cells could be included or say flow batteries, mm -hmm. um, be, you know, because the EIS, it, it perturbs the system with an AC sine wave. So it, it, you know, you're technically not changing the system at all. So would you be able to measure it on like, you know, a system with no flow, for example, like, or conversely, you know, can you have like a flowing system with that, with that, like the difference between those two, would that kind of impact your results at all? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by a system with no flow. Oh, so like, let's say, um, I guess in your context for a, a fuel cell, um, you know, you, you have, um, like flow in and out of the fuel cell in, in like standard operation but you know if you were to just perform a measurement on the fuel cell you know without flowing gases for example oh i see um that's a good question and uh just to provide a visual uh illustration let's get back to uh say this slide here let it load it takes a couple seconds okay here we go so um in the context of a fuel cell, right, we have two electrodes, for example, right, we have a hydrogen fed anode and oxygen fed cathode. However, um, the issue with uh, fuel cells, for example, because we produce water, 
and water changes uh, hydration state of the uh, electrolyte. It may change the conductivity distribution in our electrodes. And we don't want that because that makes the spectrum more complicated and it's more difficult to analyze. So what we do is we feed cathode with nitrogen, which, uh, which means there's no uh, for, for that reaction there anymore. And we end up with, uh, this, with, uh, with this impedance here, which is a straight uh, vertical line, instead of having uh, a semicircle. So you can think of it as infinite charge transfer resistance, right? If you move the, if you make the diameter infinitely large, your spectrum will just shoot up straight. Um, would this be what you meant then by uh, no flow? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you can kind of like, modify your experiments like so you know in a traditional fuel cell you wouldn't necessarily flow nitrogen through it but you can no, kind yeah. of change your um experimental parameters so you can isolate what you want to measure like in this exactly case, transfer resistance. exactly okay yes. yeah that that makes sense thank you yeah um, and i think we have 10 messages in the chat uh i i don't see them like i mean like i can look at them right now but yeah, I, I can only see three. So maybe they people might have been sending questions to you. Um, uh, so okay, I'll, I'll, maybe, maybe. Uh, let yeah. me uh, let me see if I can uh, open them up. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So oh, and also it looks like I've lost my video signal. So hopefully you guys don't mind. Uh, I'm still here with you via yeah. via voice. Um, That's okay. So. Uh, first question, what is meant by dynamic EIS? What, what's its application? Uh, what are the procedure required to decon deconvolute each? Uh, I, I guess the message wasn't wrapped here. And then what are the procedure required to deconvolute and compare each and every processes and steps taking place in a battery? Uh, and I guess there is a different uh, question there. Um, what is meant by dynamic EIS? Uh, I don't know what dynamic EIS refers to. Um, I don't know if you have uh, clarified your message uh, later. Um, if, if you can, maybe clarify it. I could guess maybe it refers to nonlinear EIS uh, when we don't have to have, uh, not, we don't necessarily have a, a steady state point. Um, what's meant by it and what are its applications? Um, well, it's hard to tell. It depends on your system. Uh, in, in the context that I just discussed, uh, when we have a shift in current or voltage, it's just simply um, and, uh, something that we have to overcome to end up with a, uh, with a linear response. Like, as I said, we can uh, correct for the drift using a, a, a uh, potential that software, but I really am not sure what 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 you mean by dynamic IS. Yeah, so maybe you can clarify that. And then uh, in the end, they ask: in all purely inductive systems, the phase difference will be exactly ninety degree uh, ninety degrees. Um, yeah, I mean, um, if it's a pure so pure capacitor and pure inductor, right? Uh, if you look at the Nyquist plot, it's a straight line. So if you see a straight line, then it's a purely capacitive or purely inductive process. So for example, um, when, oh, let me uh, uh, use my pointer. Hard. Okay, there you go. Um, here, right, as we approach low frequencies, because the impedance of a capacitor is uh, inversely proportional to the frequency, it um, it grows as, as frequency decreases. So we become overwhelmingly capacitive and we have a straight line. We would have the same in inductive behavior, but the other way around because the, uh, because the imaginary component would be uh, positive. Um, next question uh, by the same person, what is the application of Fourier transform in EIS? Good question. I, I just mentioned Fourier, Fourier transform once in my presentation, but uh, I didn't go into the details there. Uh, the thing about Fourier transform is it transform it, it. You can use a Fourier transform on a sinusoidal signal to easily extract its frequency. Um, it's uh, especially easy to do if you have uh, a single frequency, um, a single frequency uh, signal, 
in that case, if you look at the frequency composition that you get from the Fourier transform, if you plot the Fourier transform magnitude versus frequency, you will have a single peak at the frequency of your signal. So it's easy to extract the frequency using the Fourier transform. And that's what actually uh, the equipment does in, in the background for you. It analyzes the, the periodic signals with some sorts of Fourier transforms. Uh, what do I mean by voltage drift? Is it, is it not a question? Um, so imagine you operate your cell at a constant current. Um, if you do so, and if you have, uh, so your cell takes some time to stabilize, right? If you have a flow battery or a fuel cell, you have gases flowing. When you do the EIS, you usually switch to the uh, given current from some other current or from OCV, right? Because you have the switch and we have dynamic processes, it takes time for uh, your cell to stabilize. And sometimes you even have a background process taking place, such as, um, I don't know, maybe your cell very quickly degrades, or maybe your battery, if you have a battery, it discharges very quickly, right? So your uh, volts or current, even though you operate at the given, at the constant input, your output may have a static component that changes with time. So you will have a drift. Uh, next question is from Gillian, uh, or Gillian, I'm sorry, uh, if I pronounced it wrong. Uh, the code for, oh, sorry, I guess that's the, sorry, that's the code for the seminar. Um, I mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, taking multiple EIS measurements at the time and reporting the standard deviation. Would you be able, uh, would you, what would you say is the acceptable standard deviation between different measurements on the same cell? What about between different individual cells, but prepared the same way? Same chemistry, overloading, et cetera, et cetera. Very good question. Um, so the uh, standard deviation, uh, if you do, where's my, here, um, let me bring up the slide where I showed the error bars for, uh, from a, one of our uh, publications here. If you measure uh, the back-to-back -back, uh, EIS scans, you and if you are careful to stabilize your cell um, to have a steady state signal, um, and um, then and if that signal is the same, so your cell did not degrade significantly between the measurements, you should expect uh, relatively low standard deviations, as you can see here uh, in, in these graphs. Uh, the standard deviation, of course, uh, might be quite a bit larger uh, if you have, um, if you compare the error between the different uh, cells, different batches, for example, for cells, right? Different physically different cells. All the same composition, it's a physically different cell. Um, what the biggest issue you might have is, for example, the, D, the DC uh, point might be at a different location. The thing is, if you plot a voltage versus current, all right? The DC point is the magnitude of the slope. So even a slight change of the slope, um, even a slight change in the slope uh, will result in a significant uh, change in the DC and therefore a significant deviation between the, uh, the, two, um, uh, the, the two spectra. If the deviation is too large, uh, it might be a good idea to report error bars for back-to-back -back scans and then report multiple uh, spectra with error bars that represent multiple cells for just to prove the repeatability. Um, okay, I need to, it's a bit awkward. I have to remove the, I can, I, I need to uh, stop using the laser pointer to be able to access my messages again. Um, the next message is from Aditya. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I'm, um, thank you, I'm not, but I'm not the professor yet, but thank you. Uh, my question is with regards to the fuel cell. Can you comment on co correlating membrane hydration status with EIS data? Can we estimate the relative membrane hydration status accurately? That's a good question. I, I kind of touched on that in the end of my presentation. Uh, you can have some qualitative analysis of the membrane hydration if you look if you compare the inductive behavior if it becomes uh, larger or smaller in our paper uh, the, uh, the reference number two over here we've actually studied the the processes in taking place in the membrane the because we asked about the fuel cell specifically 
you know, it could the membrane uh, water could be transported with back diffusion, electrosmosis, etc. And we showed what effect those separate processes have on the inductive behavior. Uh, so you can uh, do uh, some hydration analysis, analysis using IES, although um, to have the proper full uh, picture, you would need to have a physical model to understand what's going on there. Another question is from uh, Moin. Um, again, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong correct, uh, incorrectly. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you. And I learned a lot from it. Uh, thank you again. Thanks again. I, I hope that what, it was useful for, for you. Well, I was wondering if there is a popular open source software slash libraries for EIS curve fitting with equivalent circuit or physical models. Um, yes, uh, there is software for fitting. Uh, in, uh, in fact, we, we even have uh, software, a little script in Python that we developed uh, ourselves for fitting charge transport properties of catalyst layers. And it's available in GitHub. And it's in the in reference. Um, and let me get back to my presentation. It would be um, where to find my reference. Uh, let me open a, an extra slide uh, that I haven't showed you, but it has a reference. So reference number one here. Um, in, in in there, you will find the link to GitHub where we have uh, published a Python code for fitting just, just the properties of catalyst layers. And it's valid not just for fuel cells, but also for electrolyzers and really any electrochemical system that deals with catalyst layers that have two different connectivities to uh, say ions and electrons. And of course there is more open source software. For example, this guy Kulikowski uh, if you follow his publications, he has GitHub account as well, where he has lots of codes for fitting impedance spectra um, of fuel cells. I don't know about other, other systems, but I'm sure uh, if you search, uh, you will find open source software for other systems as well. Another question from the same person, would repeated EIS testing accelerate the aging and deteriorate, and deteriorate the fuel cell? Well, that depends on the operating conditions uh, at the operating point at which you uh, operate your cell and, and the operating conditions as well. Of course, it could uh, make, uh, it, it could degrade your cell if you operate, um, say, like close to a CV for a very long, or you can flood the cell if you have a two phase operation with liquid water production and you have high current density. Uh, so yes, it can happen, especially given that in EIS, that you measure uh, high to low frequencies. And if you have low frequency measurement, it takes longer. So uh, whatever process it takes place, it, it's a higher chance of affecting your, your cell than if you have, say have a quick uh, voltage linear scan um, that doesn't take as long. So yes, it is possible. So you should be... Uh, um, um, aware of that in your measurements. Uh, next question is from Yad. Uh, to perform EIS analysis for the catalytic system or oxidation reaction a reduction process, how should we determine the voltage for performing experiment? Should we follow the voltage from the CV analysis where the oxidation or reduction processes uh, take place? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say CV. So in the very beginning, I mentioned, remember the uh, elephant thing, uh, the EIS, even though it's a powerful technique, you should use other techniques to complement the EIS data to understand your electrochemical system. And in this case, you would use the CV, for example, right? To see what of the chemical process takes place or dominates at the given, um, at the given voltage. Uh, so yes, the CVs will help understand and will, that will tell you something about the um, your electrochemical reactions. Um, uh, next question from, from uh, Nataraju. I missed the part of your presentation due to watching kids at home. That's okay. I, I believe the recording will be available later. And I will also uh, share my slides uh, with Keith. Maybe you can just keep it the slides after this. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, all right, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, would you be oh, so the next the question is, would you be okay to share your presentation slides in PDF format? Yeah, yeah. As I said, no problem at all. Uh, that was my intention from the very beginning. Next question from Ivaner. Ivaner, again, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Aslan, for the outstanding talk. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you think it might be possible to deconvolute the diffusion process with different diffusion length? i.e. diffusion in solid and liquid phases in a battery electrode, how much does the geometry of the system, uh, size and alignment of the electrodes affect the quality of EIS spectrum? That's a good question. The thing about EIS is you deal with different frequencies that correspond to different time scales, right? So if, if the diffusion in these in the different materials in your uh, system in a battery, and I, I don't want to be a battery, so I'm not entirely sure, but if these two diffusion processes have different time scales, uh, sufficiently different from each other, that they appear as different features in the EIS spectrum, then yes, you could deconvolute the two processes and maybe you can conduct your experiments under, under different conditions to see how these two uh, distinct features change. So that will tell you which process dominates uh, under the specific condition, right? So if the feature becomes uh, bigger, they have a bigger arc, for example, you know that that process, it became more important under this condition. Um, the geometry of the system, um, so the geometry of the system affects the physics taking place, right? Uh, if you have um, a slow diffusion and a large enough system, uh, and then your diffusion will be a semi infant warbird, right? As we discussed uh, before. So it's a simple uh, straight line with a constant uh, constant phase, um, if, if separated, of course, also from the rest of the spectrum. But if you have uh, the, the diffusion length that is comparable to the size of your uh, domain, then you might have either a reflective boundary condition, so no flux, or exchange of concentration, so like a Dirichlet condition. And those correspond to uh, open Warburg, sorry, uh, to the, oh yeah, open Warburg and uh, the bounded Warburg elements. And they have different uh, shapes that I discussed in my presentation. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, geometry definitely uh, affects the, the spectrum as well. And especially if the geometry is non-uniform, uh, if you have non-uniform thickness of your electrode or your, your, your electrode itself is non-uniform, then the spectrum will have a more complex shape um, as, as I discussed. So it will be more difficult to analyze with a simpler analytical models. Um, uh, next question from uh, Gulzeb. Uh, can you please provide the seminar code again? Oh, I guess that's not yeah. to me, that's okay. And then there's a code at the bottom. Uh, okay, so I guess we went through all the questions that uh, were asked. So. So, oh. so yeah, I think that's everything. I can't see any more questions. So I guess with that, we can end things off. So thanks again, Aslan. We really appreciate uh, all your insightful answers and the great talk. I'm, I'm sure everybody learned a lot about EIS here. Um, so that was really great to have you. And yeah, if you can email me the slides, I can distribute them uh, to everybody who attended. Um, and yeah, just as a quick, uh, a quick update from the Waterloo ECS. So this was uh, the second event in our seminar series. Uh, we're gonna be taking a break until the new year. So you can stay tuned for another event. Um, sometime in January, we'll probably be advertising it. So um, yeah, with that, I'd like to wish everybody a great day. And yeah, let's uh, thanks again to Aslan for the great talk. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. It was my pleasure. Uh, and thank, thank you everyone uh, for attending. Um, I. Again, I hope you found this useful. And if you have more questions, feel free to email me at this address. I'll be more than glad to answer your questions later on. Yeah, maybe you could put your email address into the chat just in case anybody's, uh, anybody's interested. Oh yeah, sure, uh, one second. Or if it's in the slides, I guess that works too. Uh, here's my email address oh, in the sorry. chat. Yes, it's, it's on the slides, yeah. Oh, sorry, I said that to just one guy. Everyone, uh, let me just... Uh, there you go. Now it's sent to everyone. So that's my email address. And Perfect. then you, know, you will find the email in my presentation when I share my slides as well.
so yeah, again, thanks very much. Uh, it was very exciting. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks again, Asan. Um...